data it's the buzzword of the new age data as qualities data as quantities data as numbers facts values and descriptions these pieces of data represent the totality of everything around us but with billions of living species and physical phenomena and innumerable man-made structures and systems there's a huge challenge how can we handle enormous quantities of data to extract useful information that's a question of science development is defined by technology and technology only moves when puzzles find innovative solutions in this new millennium the puzzles are more intricate than ever before like building governance systems for a population exceeding a billion or cracking disease by decoding billions of dna components or simulating the future of our climate by calculating countless physical and chemical phenomena and much much more how can these enormously complex problems be handled not just accurately but also swiftly in a word computers computers are devices that can handle data efficiently and accurately the human brain is an incredible computer it can store large amounts of data as memory it can also use this data efficiently for survival and development its artificial counterpart is similar in many respects today computers have become an indispensable part of our lives they're storehouses of data from offices to homes from personal computers to large networks and supercomputers so how do they work computers have two essential functions storage and data processing a computer storage capacity is called its memory inside this memory all data is stored as bits or binary values of 0 and 1 whether text audio or images everything is stored in a computer as codes made out of 0 and 1 besides storing it a computer also processes data in its central processing unit or cpu how does this happen that depends on how a computer is programmed to handle data or as computer programmers would put it it all depends on the algorithm an algorithm is a system of logic that a computer uses to perform a specific task let's take a simple example of an algorithm imagine a lamp that isn't working the first logical step is to check if it's plugged in if no plug it in if yes check if the bulb is burnt out if yes replace the bulb if no then logic suggests that it's time to buy a new lamp how quickly and efficiently a computer executes an algorithm operation denotes its strength this strength is measured in flops or floating point operations per second The more flops a computer can perform, the more powerful it is. And some computers are very powerful indeed. This is the Param Yuva 2, India's most powerful computing device. So powerful and complex is its ability that it is classified as a supercomputer. What makes this machine a supercomputer? Simply put, a supercomputer has massive storage capacities and is made up of multiple central processing units or CPUs. These CPUs are intelligently networked so that a complicated task can be broken down into smaller ones. This makes supercomputers some of the most advanced and efficient machines on the planet. In India, that place of pride belongs to the Param Yuva 2, which runs at over 500 teraflops. This means it can compute 
into 10 to the power 12 operations per second. It's a remarkable advancement in Indian computing. And it's been a long time in the making. In the 1960s, supercomputing was dominated by the United States of America. It was the birthplace of the first supercomputer developed by Seymour Cray. Considered the father of supercomputers, Seymour Cray and his company continued to build the next generation of supercomputers through the 70s. By the 1980s, countries like Japan had also joined the race. Meanwhile, India too began to dream of its own supercomputer. But the going wasn't easy. The Americans refused to export any machines or know-how. This sanction fueled Indian scientists to ask an all-important question. Why can't we develop our own supercomputer? We are done well in the nuclear program, Dr. Bhava, and then we are done in the space program with Vikram Sarabhai. So let us give this challenge to our Indian scientists so that, we'll, that let us develop our own supercomputer. In our first segment of Policy Watch today, we will analyze the draft Civil Aviation Citizen Charter. It could be regulated, it could be minimal, and even better, it could be done by competition. I think our main worry should be about infrastructure. With the kind of growth that we are having in aviation sector, will the infrastructure be adequate to meet the requirements? In our next segment of Policy Watch, we will analyze the IBC ordinance. It's important to to recognize that you are implicitly a lender. So this will clearly facilitate uh, uh, both the construction sector and house buying uh, by individuals. The creditors, which are the banks, most of them are public sector banks. If they lose money, then the burden falls on the exchequer and then the taxpayer, you and me. Yes. So the public policy goal is to minimize the haircut that banks have to take while resolving a bad asset. And so, in 1988, India's finest scientists and computer engineers came together to form CDAC, the Center for Development of Advanced Computing. Their first task, building India's first completely indigenous supercomputer, Param 8000. Nobody had worked on the new architecture which you're talking about, the parallel computing. Parallel processing, even IITs. The IIT is also just emerging that something is like this is emerging. And Cray had made a statement, Samuel Cray, who is the father of supercomputers, made a statement that this is not going to work. But the CDAC group would prove this wrong. By 1991, they had built the Param 8000, a one gigaflop supercomputer. It was just the beginning. Over the next three decades, the Param series kept India at par with global supercomputing technology. There was the Param 10,000 at 10 gigaflops, the Param Padma at 1 teraflop, the Param Yuva at 40 teraflops, and the latest Param Yuva 2 at 500 teraflops. The name Param means supreme in Sanskrit, but it has another meaning. Param is short for parallel machine, indicating it runs on a system called parallel computing. What exactly does that mean? Parallel computing is a wonderful way to solve very large and complicated tasks by breaking them into smaller ones. The same thing happens inside a supercomputer like Param Yuva 2. Big calculations or problems are divided into smaller operations. These smaller operations are solved simultaneously by different CPUs. These CPUs are networked in parallel using the indigenously designed Param Net. You can imagine an array of computing elements scattered all over the place. And any application runs across those computing elements. Now the question is how do those computing elements talk to each other? That is where the role of Param Net comes into picture. Basically what you need is a very quick very fast and very intelligent network. But what do all these intelligently networked supercomputers do for us? 
the biggest impact has been on the science and technology world itself. Traditionally, research and development has had two basic tools, theory and experiment. Now thanks to supercomputers, there's a third tool driven by mathematical data. With the ad advancement of supercomputing, a new model for R&D has been infused in the research and development area and that is simulation and modeling. What does this mean? Simulation or mathematical modeling is used to describe a variety of problems. From weather forecasting to biological systems, from structural mechanics to physical and chemical systems, and even political, economical and social systems. These models rely on expressing all such phenomena as mathematical values and equations. This mathematical data can be incredibly large and complex to understand. That's where high-performance computing and supercomputers come in. Supercomputers actually enable simulation and modeling of complex data and enable us actually to model the real scenarios of the world. One of the key areas where simulation and modeling are helping India is in weather forecasting. For an agriculture dependent nation like ours, predicting the weather accurately, especially the monsoon, is very critical. The study of weather phenomena and the forecasting of it uh, involves quite a few systems together. And to solve this, there are a lot of mathematical equations, about 10,000 to 20,000 mathematical equations we need to solve. So from that point of view, it becomes very, very complex when you have to solve this in a short time. Keeping this challenge in mind, scientists at CDAC Center for Atmospheric Sciences find innovative ways to use supercomputers. They've developed different models for quick and accurate predictions. These include regional weather forecasting models, monsoon prediction models, simulations to predict cyclones, and models to predict the impact of polluting emissions and aerosols. With supercomputing technology, you have now high networks, high co uh, connectivity. People can directly have these uh, predictions uh, and the advisories based on that on your mobiles, on your uh, laptop, on your uh, you know, desktop where people can take decisions. Mathematical models when processed through supercomputers like the Param Yuva 2 help us visualize the future. This future could be about the weather in the next few days or it could be about the climate a few decades from now. This futuristic picture can push us to make positive changes today. In terms of next 20 years, 30 years, what sort of policies people can look into when we are talking about climate change modeling? Uh, we can, we'll be able to guide a uh, few of the science-based decisions. Art arisen from a multi-hued cultural canvas. Tradition and cultural fervor dating back centuries. And encircling them all, there's a magic that awes. Embrace your nation's brilliant human warmth. Watch Colors of India, Sundays at 9.30 p.m. on Rajya Sabha Television. While advanced computing is bringing the future alive in one lab, in another, it's acting like a microscope simulating the complex worlds of molecular biology. Supercomputers like the Param have enabled an exciting new area in life sciences called bioinformatics. If you look at the, how biology has evolved uh, over the past two decades or so, uh, it has changed from something which was purely an experimental science 
to a high end computational uh, domain bioinformatics unites computing technology with fields like neuroscience and genetics etc but why do we need supercomputers in these areas that's because at the molecular and cellular level things can happen in the millions and even billions for example sequencing the human genome the human genome is the unique blueprint of the human species it contains all the information coded in a strand of dna this strand contains billions of base pairs made of proteins which code for about 20 to 30000 genes all these genes need to be sequenced or cataloged bioinformatics labs like the one at cedac help biologists do exactly that and it's all done using supercomputers the human genome was sequenced in 2000 and it took something like 13 years to sequence it it took something like 23 labs across the world to sequence it it took something like 500 million dollars today you can do it uh, you know with one machine you can do it in less than 3 days and you can do it for 10000 dollars so clearly you can see that the data generation has become much more easy today than it what it was 20 years ago bioinformatics has had a major impact on genome sequencing not just of humans but also of other living species it's assisted in the conservation of animals the hunt for microbial biofuels and even in developing improved varieties of agricultural products but one of its most profound applications is set to impact the future of our own health imagine a time in the not so distant future when you walk into a doctor's office what if instead of being prescribed the same medicine that's used on countless other patients you get something more custom designed that's the future of personalized medicine what we are actually trying to work towards is create virtual humans in supercomputers that is we'll create uh, virtual human beings with different types of genomic structure on the computer systems and try to see what type of medicine works better on to which virtual human you go to a doctor with uh, you know your your entire genome on a pen drive and the doctor sees your genome and then he knows you are allergic to certain medicines but certain medicines are very good for you and that's what you can really prescribe this future may be closer than we know meanwhile supercomputers have already become a vital part of our lives can you guess the different ways in which they make an impact supercomputers are used by architects and civil engineers to test how strong their designs will be once constructed they used to predict events like earthquake and floods they used by government agencies to provide valuable services to the public they used by pharmaceutical companies to make new drugs they even used to animate intricate computer graphics in movies and video games and so the more advanced the supercomputer the more advanced the country's technology with the param yuva 2 at 500 teraflops india now stands on the threshold of developing its first petaflop supercomputer This incredible supercomputer will be able to perform a mind-boggling 10 to the power 15 operations a second. This would put Indian technology on par with the world. But scientists at CDAC are looking even further. The world is contemplating that we will have a hexaflop system in the near future somewhere around 2020. A hexaflop system is capable of calculating 10 to the power 18 floating point operations per second we are also discussing that india should start working towards hexascale r&d but upscaling a supercomputer isn't just about building the machine it requires an entire ecosystem of supercomputing india has a national supercomputing facility 
and the CDAC TerraScale supercomputing facility. Together, they provide science research institutes across the country easy access to Param machines. CDAC is also helping institutes build their own supercomputers and is training a new generation of specialists in high performance computing. It's a long way from 1988 when India was first denied supercomputing technology from the West. Today, the country has a large spread of supercomputing machines across different institutes. And so, CDAC has helped develop a national supercomputing grid called Garuda. Grid Garuda actually has more than 70 academic uh, and research institutions as partners okay, on the grid. And this grid runs on the NKN backbone network, the national knowledge network backbone network which India decided to create as a national uh, high performance backbone network for the country. In the last three decades, Indian scientists and engineers have surpassed every expectation. These supercomputing specialists have dispelled all doubts about their indigenous capabilities. In doing so, they have driven technology for the entire nation. Whether it's in the area of fluid dynamics, whether it's in the area of uh, high performance computing, whether it's in the area of computational uh, sciences, computational biology, computational chemistry, we are nowhere behind anywhere in the world. And that has been an empowering uh, phenomena that has come up. Again, because of the computational technology which are available. Today, we sit in the same club as of others and that's a great challenge. That's a great empowerment for our own people. That's a great pride for all of us. If you'd like to share your feedback on today's program, please send your suggestions and comments to Vigyan Prasar, C24 Kutub Institutional Area, New Delhi, 110016 or you can mail us at info at vigyanprasar.gov.in